do it. Ed Lewis and Clarence Smith. Oh, my God. Coming down the home stretch, Carter G. Woodson. Don't have time to go into that. Look at that, Philippians. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, lovely report. Think on these things. Hear what the man said? Think on these things. Who in God's name wrote those words? Paul. And what in the world was he doing at the time? He was in a prison cell in Rome. Lowest point in his life. Think on these things. Believe in yourself. Think on these things. The subtitle of my first book, A Black Choice. Why is that critically important? Think on these things. Because you're going to be faced with 50 million different choices in your life. And 99.9% .9 you can avoid. You don't have to address. You can kick them to the curb, throw them under the bus. But baby, there are two choices that you got to face day in and day out. And you better have your mind right. Number one, you can accept the circumstances as they are. Or number two, you can take the responsibility to change them. I can go anywhere and say, baby, you're homeless, you're broke. Your problem isn't that you're broke. Your problem is you don't have a strategy to overcome your poverty. Problem is that you're homeless, you don't have a strategy. Problem is you don't have tuition money, you don't have a strategy. The four elements of strategy, what's the best that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? Number three, what will probably happen? And number four, are you willing to tolerate the worst in order to achieve the best? Couple more before I sit down. Oh my God. Oh my God. The hell was I doing back in September? Comerica, I was giving a presentation in front of one of your competitors, Northern Trust. Northern Trust, their annual Wealth Dreamers Symposium. This is a symposium where they track black millionaires. They have done this for more than a decade, 10 years. And they called this little country business school professor, Dr. Kimbrough, we heard about what you were doing, blah, blah, blah. Clee, please come in and speak and share some of your data. And there I was, and I gave my little dog and pony show who was the next, next speaker to get up and speak? Bob Johnson of BET. I interviewed him years ago. It was good to see him again. And Bob Johnson got up there, and he was at the podium. And he said, and these were all packed just like this. Everybody was seven figure. If you weren't seven figure, baby, you did not get in the door. And he stood up there. And he said, black America, I got some good news and I got some bad news, but overall, we got a problem. He said, as you know, I own the Charlotte Bobcats. And as you know, there are 30 NBA teams. And as you know, each team has 13 to 14 players. And as you know, the average contract of an NBA player is $5 million for three years. And as you know, the NBA is 80% black male. He said, this is the most powerful from an economic and financial standpoint. Backdrop, this is the most powerful group of black males in the world. That's the good news. The bad news is no one knows how they invest and save their money. I sign their paychecks and they don't even come to me for financial advice. You got one boy on the Dallas Cowboys. I guess my phone be ringing soon. Denver Nuggets just brought me in to speak. A couple of months ago, wasn't even a couple of months. I was minding my business. I come home, grab me a cold one, go on the deck, hug and kiss girlfriend. What's up? Said, you got an engagement coming. I said, okay, good. With who? Denver Nuggets bring. I said, you're kidding. I said, how they hear about me? The owner, he, the YouTube or something, the owner, man. He's like, come in there. And there I was in the locker room. And the gentleman who spoke before me in that locker room was from the league office on Park Avenue, New York. And he was telling about some procedure they had to adhere to, some certification. Okay, David Stern says from now on you got to do A, B, C, X, Y, Z. And there are the players in there. They just got through with practice. They weren't paying any attention. Some were over there texting. Kmart had ice on his knees. Birdman doing something. <laughs> and so the vice president of player development 
sees the way the players are reacting to this guy from the league office, and he looks at me almost apologetically like, man, if they don't pay attention, I'm sorry. And he went like this. And I said, man, no problem, no problem, because I knew I was next. <laughs> then he walks over to me and goes, uh, Doc, um, you need a microphone? Hell no, I don't need no mic. We're in the locker room. All right, we got a guy, the owner wants this guy to speak to you about wealth and finance and take care, blah, 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 all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Dennis Kimbra. And when I stood right there, I said, two things you'll find about me, man. Number one, I won't take much of your time. Number two, I won't be boring. And I know that the average contract is $5 million over three years. And I, some of you, I know some of you are bank-like, Hank. I'm really not impressed, but I'd be more impressed if you are earning that type of money when you're my age. You guys don't do anything for me. I don't want to do anything for you. As a matter of fact, I don't even want your autograph. And when I said that, they put down whatever they put down and start taking notes with both hands. <laughs> I want to be the next Michael Jordan. Dwayne Wade exclaimed to his financial advisors, that's going to take a little bit of the time when his financial plan is replied. You're rich, but Jordan is wealthy. What do you mean, Wiz? Wade quipped. That's flipping through the pages of GQ magazine. Rich means that if you're not careful with your spending, one day you'll eventually be broke. Wealthy, on the other hand, means that nothing or no one can touch you. As we wrap this bad boy up, I got one of my former students in here, and she can attest. The last class in my class, I've been doing this for 15 years, is always take a millionaire to lunch. We push corporate on the kids so much, man. This is the first time they can really spread the entrepreneur wings. We bring a certified millionaire there. You know me, I'm a sponsor to lunch. And I let the millionaire go ahead and talk and do his thing, tell him how he or she did it. And I've had a who's who. You know, I'll just pick up the phone. Last week, one of the four millionaires was Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey came down to speak to my kids, man. I've had athletes, I've had entertainers, I've had, you know, just run-of-the-mill millionaires, blah, blah, blah. And I had this brother right here, Reuben McDaniel. And you listen to me, Dallas, Texas. You may or may not know that Usher made two fortunes over the course of his career. His first fortune, baby, he blew through. He didn't even know what happened to the money. But the second fortune that he made, he had an epiphany. He had an aha moment that he didn't want to be over the course of his life when he got up in years, some rundown singer singing in backroom joints. And so he tracks down Reuben McDaniel. Reuben McDaniel stood in the same pit where I stand every Tuesday and Thursday and spoke to my kids. Because all of them want to go into sports and entertainment. I've got my own record label. Oh, okay, really? <laughs> so Usher, goes ahead and tracks down Reuben McDaniel, who was a business partner of Maynard Jackson. And he says to him, Reuben McDaniel begins to interview him, and he says, um, gee, um, why, why me? What, what would you propose? He said, well, I just don't want to, you know, blow my money and everything. I don't want to be singing in some back club, you know, for my fare, for my money, just to make ends meet. I want to hold on to what I have. And then he says to Usher, can I see, so you have a financial statement? Do you have a spreadsheet? And he hands it to Usher. I mean, he hands it to Reuben McDaniel, and Reuben McDaniel looks at his finances, and he goes, oh, my God. Oh. Mm. Now, that is interesting. Ooh, look at this. Now, that is really interesting. Um, okay, uh, do you have any financial goals, Mr. Usher? No, not really. Okay, well, before we get started, I have a form that I want you to fill out, and he hands them the form. And Usher looks at the form and he says, this is an application to McDonald's. What is this about? He said, why am I filling this out? He said, because if you keep spending the way that you're spending, you're going to need to fill out that application. <laughs> he said, how many Rolls Royces do you need, Mr. Usher? <laughs> how many Rolexes do you need? And they put him on a budget and said, you sign with me because I'm not going to waste my time. If we're going to handle your money, we will only put you on a budget. You will spend only 10% of what you are, and that is enough. So moving right along, what else do we have up here? You cannot change your life. You can only change your habits, and your habits will change your life. Well, boys and girls, I found four common chords in all these men and women. Number one, they had a dream, a passion, something they desperately wanted to accomplish in life. Point number two, 
They were inner directed versus outer directed. In other words, they weren't so quick to believe well-meaning friends or family members who said, you can't do this, you can't do that. They walked to a beat of a different drummer. And that's why the old poet Robert Frost was so apropos when he wrote years ago, two roads diverge in the wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by. In other words, you are unique. You cannot succeed being like everybody else if you're going to accrue great wealth. So what's the opposite of success? The opposite of success is not failure. The opposite of success is conformity. You'll never succeed conforming to the wishes, norms, and mores of others. And here we go. God, I love Maynard Jackson. I love Maynard Jackson. When he made his transition, I cried. Maynard Jackson didn't know me from Adam. When I was writing What Makes the Great Great, I asked for an interview, and he didn't know me, and he says, Dennis, I'll tell you what, my brother, don't interview me, but why don't you just shadow me one week through City Hall? Imagine shadowing Maynard Jackson through City Hall. And what is Maynard Jackson's claim to fame, Dallas MBAs, that he was the first black southern male mayor of a metropolitan area? But no. Maynard Jackson's claim to fame, he was the first individual who got the idea that an airport should be a shopping mall where people can catch a flight. And that was his idea. And now you look at DFW. Now you go to Cincinnati. Go to Denver Stapleton. It all began with Maynard Jackson. When Maynard Jackson took office in Atlanta, you had the number one brand in the world in Coca-Cola. But you couldn't even get a Coke and sandwich out at that airport. And he said, something's wrong with this picture. We are going to engage in it. Thomas Kuhn, Harvard Business School. Paradigm shift. <laughs> and baby, if you don't like it, we're going to rebuild this airport brick by brick. We're going to use minority representation. And if you don't like it, damn it, I'm going to lay down on the runway. And what did Maynard do in the process? Personally created 14 millionaires. And as I close out, Maya Angelou, what did I learn from Maya Angelou? And daughters, what is Maya Angelou's claim to fame? That she wrote a poem and it was recited at Bill Clinton's inauguration? Bant, hell no. That's not her claim to fame. Her claim to fame is that in 1969, she was the first black female streetcar conductor in San Francisco. And if you ever got on one of her streetcars, you would swear that her name was on the side of that streetcar. How you doing today? Your boss has been on you because you've been late twice. I'm going to get you there early. You got an interview. Everybody pray that he gets that job. Baby, Raquel, you got a doctor's appointment. Don't you worry. Those tests are going to come back negative. Okay, everybody hold on. Let's go. Here we go. That's what she did over the course of her life. And what did she share with me? Years from now, people will never remember what you said. They will never remember what you did. But they will never forget how you made them feel. And I hope and pray I made you feel good. People can pat me on the back, Dr. Kimbrough, your books, blah, blah, blah. And I can say, yes, my books are all that. You know why I can say that? Not because I'm narcissistic. Not because of my personal aggrandizement. But my books are never about me. They're always about the individual that I sat before. Somebody said it couldn't be done, but he with a chuckle replied that maybe he couldn't, he would be one who wouldn't say till he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he'd hit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done and he did it. Somebody scoffed, oh, you'll never do that. At least no one ever has done it. But he took off his coat and he took off his hat and the first thing we know, he begun it with a lift of his chin and a bit of a grin without any doubting or quitting. He started to sing as he tackled the thing. That couldn't be done and he did it. There are thousands to tell you cannot be done. There are thousands to prophecy failure. There are thousands ready to point out to you one by one the dangers that wait till assail you. But with a lift of your chin and a bit of your grin, you just take off your coat and go to it. You starting to sing as you tackle the thing. I don't want to hear any excuses. I don't. We got enough talent in this room to change anything. And that's not me, damn it. That's Malcolm Gladwell. That's the next book you need to read, Tipping Point. If you haven't read Tipping Point, shame on you. What, 
What is the backdrop? What is the keynote of harmony to Tipping Point and Malcolm Gladwell? Any problem, any problem can be solved if only enough people care. Any problem if only enough people care. Dallas, black NBAs, we gonna change this paradigm. We're gonna make a difference because we care. Spit in his face, I'll show you Marcus Garvey, slam the school, for, a school door in her face, she becomes Mary McLeod Bethune. Write him off as another fatherless black male, I'll show you Ben Carson, make him shine your shoes. He's Colin Powell, blind him, Stevie Wonder, raper Maya Angelou, spit in his face, Marcus Garvey. Tell him can't lead. Comes Barack Obama. Confine him to the frigid stoves in the North Pole. I'll show you Matthew Henson. Put him in a prison cell. Throw away the key, Malcolm X. We got enough folks who care. And tell that individual, man, why are you going to go out and hear this, brother? Man, come on, man. It's about wealth. And that's why you're here. What in God's name did Mary tell Martha? He's able. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Brother Clifton, come on down here while I take my seat. Where's Brother Clifton? Any questions? Come on down, Brother Clifton. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, we do have a few. You got um, a few. So we are going to have two mics in both aisles ask some questions, but we're going to start off by um, me asking a question that was sent to couple of questions and we're going to get up and get out of here. If you, do, um, if you do have a question, though, go ahead and raise your hand. And we've got uh, two people with mics. And uh, we'll start with on the left side and go to the right. But in the meantime, I want to go ahead and ask one of the questions that was sent in in advance. Sent in in advance. Send that question in in advance. <laughs> Oh, I'll be glad when and I get my glasses. My Tom just said, why do you wear those things? You can't see out of them. Ooh. And Dr. Kimber, you spoke about this. You mentioned um, the number of black millionaires and- 35,000. Right. Well, overall, there's been an increase in billionaires and millionaires regardless of race. Yeah, who's gonna be the next black billionaire? Jay-Z. Jay-Z. But Jay-Z learned the problem the hard way. Why do we have a dress code to school of business? Because you never know who's looking. That's why we got a dress code. As soon as that first year in, uh, business student hits campus, give him a red polo or a blue shirt. You can wear any shirt you want to wear, as long as it's red or blue. <laughs> any shirt you want to wear. And why did I say Jay-Z? Because Jay-Z and Biggie Small went to Bernard Arnault. Who the hell's Bernard Arnault? C CEO of Louis Vuitton Mo at Hennessy? They went to Bernard Arnault and they said to him, my brother, we can impact your bottom line. Man, we need to cut a deal and we can blow Moet Hennessy up. And what did the CEO of Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy say to Biggie and Jay-Z? Man, y'all are just a bunch of rappers wearing baggy jeans and oversized tees. Dissed them, blew them off. Jay-Z? Biggie contacted everybody, all their road dogs and hip hop, sent faxes, emails, everything from now on in our videos, we only drink Cristal. And blew Cristal off the chart. Couldn't even find Moet Hennessy. Blew it off the chart. Impacted Cristal's bottom line by almost 300%. That's the good news. The bad news, Cristal didn't pay him a dime. So that's why. And now every time you see Jay-Z, how's he dressed? <laughs> Booted and suited, brother. In his spare time, spending time with Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett started Berkshire Hathaway in 1956 with only $1,000 of his money. And he raised $109,000. He's the number two billionaire. A couple more questions and we're okay. going to scoop. Uh, one question. Does anybody have a question out here? Yes, you gave us the first two of the four things that uh, everyone has in common that haves. Okay. So we want the last two. The last two. All right. Dream big dreams, inner directed, outer directed. Number three, dedicate themselves to lifelong learning. 
dedicated themselves to lifelong learning. You don't go to school one period of your life, you're in school every day of your life. Yep. I asked Sandy Young, who had the greatest impact on his life, and right off the bat, he said, Benjamin Mays at Morehouse. I said, why Dr. Mays? I mean, you were the right-hand man to Martin Luther King. I just knew you were going to say Dr. King. He said, because you can always tell when a student at Morehouse was taking a class from Benjamin Mays. I said, what do you mean, Mr. Ambassador? He said, you can see him running across the quad. Benjamin Mays only had two rules in his classroom. Rule number one, he would always correct your English. And those juniors and seniors over at Morehouse got in Huffman as whack. Why is this guy correct my English? Benjamin Mays retorted, would you rather have me correct your English or a prospective employer correct your English? And rule number two, Benjamin Mays said, and this is what I follow in my class, Benjamin Mays said, I will always be the last one in class. He didn't care on the roll book, in the catalog, on the syllabus, class was due to start at 1 o'clock. If Dr. Mays got in that classroom at 1245, that door was closed. On time is late and early is on time and late. Well, late, damn it, is fire. And the first assignment you had to do at Morehouse when you took a class from Benjamin Mays, you had to memorize that old poem. Of only just a minute, 60 seconds in it, force upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but I know that I must use it. I'll suffer if I lose it, pay account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but baby, my life is in it. Case closed, Benjamin Mays. If I stepped on your feet, then you need to move your shoes. Maybe you need to get, I'm sorry. Okay, tell Last us. Last but not least. Tell us about how we should use financial advisors. You talked a little bit about that. Oh, wait, wait, yeah. The oh, number one. four. Fourth one. They flat out refuse to fail. They flat out refuse to fail. As you know, there are five different phases that all entrepreneurial businesses go through. You know there's a big difference between, between being an entrepreneur and being self-employed. If you're a barber, you're not an entrepreneur, you're self-employed. If you're a stylist at a salon, you're really not an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs go through five phases. What's the number one phase that blocks more than 50, 60 percent? It isn't money. They flat out refuse to fail. It's phase number three, where they're forced to build a team. They can't build teams. Teamwork is everything. Lisa Price almost went on belly up. She almost went flat on her face with Carol's daughter. Girlfriend couldn't build a team. When I interviewed the sister from Sister to Sister magazine, Almost went belly up, girlfriend couldn't build a team. Got PO'd. She worked for Bob Johnson at BET. Man, I have to take this. I'm going to start my own thing. Go. <laughs> couldn't build a team. But you don't stop there. Failure isn't failure unless you accept it as such. What did John Johnson of Ebony Magazine tell me? The first no of the day means good morning. Now, you can stop when you hear that no, or you can keep going. So what strategies do you suggest that we take as African Americans using financial advisors, using mm -hmm. the banking system to really increase our wealth? Yeah, well, it's all about information. I mean, there's only three levers that you can pull in terms of wealth, in terms of your strategy. Number one, how much you're going to save, okay? Number two, how you're going to invest it. And number three, time. I'm 60 years old, man, so uh, I want to be a little bit conservative with my earnings. If you're young or whatever, 21, then you can be, you know, as risky as you want to be. How much you're going to save, where are you going to invest it, and your time. But the bottom line when it comes to wealth strategy, don't you ever take any advice from anyone who's not in life where you want to be. Come on, come on, don't take it. The rich are rich because they act poor, and the poor are poor because they act rich.